So um, one of the one of the things we kind of left off with yesterday, you remember we kind of talked about SQL queries and, and, and went more in depth there. And I hope that gave you some more insight into some of the things that you can do with SQL um, and such. Um, and how you might fit that into, you know, the way you're displaying data and and a lot of that can figure into things like writing reports or, or generating the data in the way it makes sense for your users. Um, the thing we kind of didn't quite get to because um, we're kind of towards the end of the class by the time we got there um, is I wanted to talk about searching and, and paging. Um, and how you might implement that with some of those uh, pieces that we learned. Um, in addition to there's there's maybe some pieces that I need to touch on that we didn't cover there. Um, so one of the things I meant to mention, and I and I noticed this this kind of yes, I think it was Monday, um, but hadn't kind of factored in and forgot to mention. Um, as it turns out, in connects. There is actually a first method, which I wasn't aware of. So um, if you want to say, I just want to get the, the product by ID, we know that returns one result. Apparently, you can just do dot first to get the first result. That's instead of Lodash, right? That's instead of Lodash. I didn't realize that, that Connects had a method for that. Um, and you know that's part of just the the connects documentation kind of being sprawling. It's like oh, okay, it has a first method. I missed that. Um, and the place I actually found it. I was trolling around on on Stack Overflow answers, and somebody mentioned it. it's like oh, okay, I should have thought of that. But so so that's 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 worth taking note. Um, obviously, the Lodash one still works the way we did with the then, and then grabbing the first or or whatnot. Um, the upside of this is then you're still in the query builder land and you haven't actually executed the query yet, uh, which is different from, from what we had done. And Mr. Smith, for a while I remember there was something uh, about a dot then and a ternary operator mm -hmm. where it would re return, uh, I think it was like the first or null or yep. I, I can't remember. Is that That's not this. needed anymore? There's no That's dot this. then needed in yeah, that's all you have to do to get the first result. Um, we 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 done it with ternary. I showed you how to do it with Lodash. As it turns out, there's and, and I should have found out this earlier, but there's just a dot first method. So if you want all the results, like if you say get all products, I obviously want an array of results, right? Then I'm not gonna say first. Um, but if it's in this case, find product by ID. Only one thing, only one product has that ID, so I'd only expect one result. Okay, so, uh, there is no case where we want to return null if something isn't uh, producing results. Well, that's what this does. First says, first says, give me the first result or give me null if there are no results. Okay, if there is no array, then what happens in that case? Is that null? Empty array. Yes, yeah, so this would take the empty array and turn it into null. Right, so so if you're doing doing a select, that can give you an array with things in it, or it can give you um, an array with nothing in it. But select always gives you an array. Um, if you dot fir if you do dot first, then you get an object instead, and you get the first object, the first row. Okay, instead of an array of objects, or mm -hmm. or just an empty array. Right, instead of an empty array or whatever, you're gonna you're gonna get null if you instead of array with one thing in it, you would just get that that first item. Okay, thanks. So so that's just something I wanted to bring your attention. It's not that the other code doesn't work; it's just that oh, there's an easier way to do it, and I I I didn't know about it. Any questions there beyond what Paul had asked? Okay, so let's talk about searching. Um, so searching is is kind of a really important thing for any website, um, and, and because if you have 
a website and you have data, you're probably at some point going to have enough data that it can that that you need to be able to find what you're looking for, right? Um, so if I were to say, well, let's get you know I've got a hundred products, but I have no sort of search interface. I just have to go through those hundred products um, and look at them. Um, this is kind of a very hard page to, this is very hard to find things in, right? Yeah. Um, and, and to be fair, I have actually still seen, I was looking at a, a website just, uh, um, just a week or two ago. And as it turned out, their, their, their store didn't have any sort of search, which is kind of weird. It's like, okay, so you got hundreds of projects, products. Um, and this is a, this is a comic book store. Um, but they didn't have any way to search for, hey, I want to search for Spider-Man um, or Black Panther. It didn't provide a, a way to do that. Um, so having a search interface is, is really a, a vital place, a vital part of, of any website, um, because without it, it's it's generally hardly, use, hardly at all usable um, once you get to you know reasonable amounts of data, right? So, so having a search interface is, is an important part to that. Okay. So generally, when we're building a search interface, um, you can you can put it in one or two places. You can put it one of a few places as far as the UX is concerned. Um, sometimes you'll put it at the top of the page. You generally at the top of this this list page. Um, you might put it on the side. Some some websites put it in a sidebar, and and sometimes you'll have a quick search um, in the nav bar. Um, all of these principles apply regardless of where you end up putting it in the UI, um, but but obviously you have to tweak things a little bit depending on where you're where you're going to put it. Um, I would say usually the best place to put it in terms of responsive behavior is usually towards the top of the page um, like this. Um, so so that's where I where I've got that. Um, now one thing to know um, usually when we build these forms. Uh, generally speaking, what method have we used to submit the form? Uh, you use uh, what? Either use click or submit. Okay, Mo, what were you saying? A uh, post method. What post. do you mean by method? It's a, a method. Yeah. Yeah. Post. post. So usually we submit these as as post request. Um, search interfaces are a little bit different in the sense that normally a search interface will be a get request instead. Um, so you remember if we send a post request, all of that data goes in kind of as the request body, right? So, and that's where we were extracting it when we were looking at the data. So request bodies where we pull things out that are, are, are generally as part of a post request. You remember we used request.params to get pieces that are part of the route, right? Um, but if we have things going in as a get request, we actually have to use um, request.query um, because the way that the way things go through with the get request, they don't go part of the body, they become part of the URL. Um, so let's say I take this, this form and I'm going to put in at, and let's put in boots. So I'm going to put boots into the, the search bar. Okay. Let's say we search for boots. Um, so as soon as I hit that, you'll notice that my URL has changed, right? So I've got a few things in the URL. Um, and, and we refer to this part, starting with the question mark on, as the quote-unquote the query string. Okay, So remember that this is the query string. That's an important term to know. Um, so anytime you do a get request, that's where your parameters go. So for instance, if I look at what's in there, Remember, I typed in boots into the search field. You'll notice in the address bar, you see how it says search equals boots. Can you see that? Yeah. I'll post this here so you can look at it. Um, so each of the different fields are basically reflected in the address bar. So search is boots. Um, and I could play around with that. In fact, I could change the the address and say, well, let's search for 
um, duck. So I could say search equals duck, right? Um, so that's effectively how that parameter is being passed to the next page, okay, as part of the address bar. So, so that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, anytime you build a search interface, it's definitely going to be as get, and the parameters will be in the URL. Um, one of the reasons we do that is that a, so you can you can bookmark it, right? Um, you can I can now bookmark this page and come back to it later. Um, it also helps with SEO because because it's a post because it's a get request, um, Google can actually index this page. Um, Google couldn't index this page if this was a post request. Does that follow? Because your search engines can only index as pages that come through as a, a get request, not as a post request. Okay. Questions? Nope. Okay. Um, so there's that. Um, other thing, what was one what was one of the other benefits of, of doing this as a get request? Have you heard this term caching? Yeah. Anybody familiar with that? What is what is caching? Uh, holding things in data yeah. or holding things in like they're like I forgot it. Like holding like old information in storage. So you don't have to render new information until it's needed. Um, you're you're sort of on the right path, um, Troy. You were saying something. I mean, I was going to say something similar. It's just holding some set of information in memory. So instead of uh, like recalculating it, you just pull it down from memory. Okay. So so caching doesn't necessarily have to be in memory. Um, sometimes it's memory. Uh, sometimes it's actually just um, it can actually still be files on the on the disk and in in this case actually it is um, in some sense so there's caching that happens at at multiple levels um, caching is basically you're kind of on the right idea the idea is to reduce the amount of work you have to do if you ask for the same thing again okay the idea is to reduce how much work the system has to do if you ask for the same resource or the same page or the same, you know, whatever data again, it keeps it in a place that's easier to get to than doing the full request and the full process. Um, so things that that things that places where caching happens, caching always happens on your browser. So let's say I, I go and visit this page. Well, as soon as I visit this page, remember it had to download the page, right? Well, that page, this page is not just in memory. This page is actually, as soon as I go to visit, uh, Window, Chrome and, and Windows and most browsers actually just go ahead and save the, the page to your, your hard drive, right? So if I was go to look in my, my temporary inter, my internet files, I would find the HTML for this page. I would find the HTML, the CSS, and the JavaScript. All of those files are actually downloaded onto my computer. Right. Even the fact that even though this this page is generated, right, um, this is going through um, handlebars and, and the database and such. So this file doesn't really this page as is doesn't exist on the server as an HTML file, right? Um, but it does exist as soon as I view it on my computer. Did you say it was temporary? Like how long would it stay there? Um, so that's that's a very good question, um, and the answer is in theory they should be deleted at some point in time. Um, my experience though has been largely um, they're saved for forever until you delete them. Um, in theory, you would you would expect that I download this page and it's only saved for thirty days. Um, and, and I'm sure Chrome has some some cleanup that it eventually cleans it up maybe, um, but my experience has been unless I go delete those files, they're actually always there. Okay. 
Do we set up the stuff, or is that just Chrome? That that's Chrome. That's Chrome. Because it, it seems like with how much we use the internet now, like that, I feel like that could build up quite fast. It can. It can. Um, honestly, if I look at anybody's uh, anybody's computer that's had, you know, if you have a computer that's five plus years old and you're running out of hard drive space, there's a very good chance that a lot of that space is being consumed by pages that you visited over those years. Um, now, things that aren't auto automatically downloaded would be video and audio. Um, those don't automatically get downloaded to your um, computer, but in general, the HTML, the CSS, JavaScript, um, even images typically get actually downloaded to your computer before they're they're used and shown. Where do we delete those at? Okay, um, as far as deleting those, if you want to go back to clean, um, if I remember right, you can go into, you see I've got the triple dot, um, so hamburger there, go to more tools, and you see clear browsing data? See that? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so if I go into clear browsing data, it's going to give me a bunch of options. Okay. Um, so there's a browsing history, there's cookies and other sites, but the ones that we're interested in here, right, caching images and files. Um, that's what removes it. And so the default here, it's set to the last hour, right? Do you see the number, how much space it says that's consumed in just the last hour? 164 yeah. megabytes? That's all the stuff that it's downloaded in just the last hour. Um, I can go to all time, um, it looks like it must be cleaning it up at this point because it didn't used to be cleaning it up because it's still at 164 for all time and I haven't cleaned this in a long time. Um, so I think that I think that Google's probably gotten better about this, but even going back to especially if you're using IE, IE never cleans itself up. <laughs> never has been my experience. IE doesn't clean itself up unless you tell it to go do this, which is where Windows has the prompt to tell you every once in a while, hey, you're, you're running out of space on your hard drive and do this to clean things up, right? Um, so that's where I would go if I wanted to clear it out. Cool? So I just do check all that, hit clear data, and it would be gone. So it seems like Google's been updated to clear, what, every yeah, couple days or so? More, more recently, yeah, it looks like. Because um, I would expect there to be a lot more in there. But okay. Windows has been a lot. It's still good to know that there's some um, browsers that don't clear. Yeah. Um, if you go to disk cleanup and, and you were to run this, um, this is where you can kind of see how much is in there potentially from Windows. Um, so for instance, I think, is it temporary files? Temporary internet files. Um, so this is, this is the place where you get to it for like Internet Explorer and Edge. Um, and I don't really use Edge. I don't use Internet Explorer anymore. So obviously that's a small number. Um, but I've, I've seen a lot of computers, especially ones going back to, um, you know, maybe uh, Windows 7 or especially XP where people had gigabytes of data here in temporary internet files. Wow. Um, to the point that that just clogged up their, their, uh, um, clogged up their hard drive and made everything slower and just going and clearing that. It's like, oh, your, your old computer runs faster. <laughs> because we deleted all the temporary files. Um, so it looks like it's gotten better. Um, so the point there is, is so caching happens, right? The, the pages I've at least visited in the last hour, it seems, you know, this file, is, this page for sure, it has already gone and, and downloaded and kept on my computer. Um, so if I went and looked there, I would find this. I would find some files for Inside Reckon. I would find some files for uh, bootstrap documentation because I have those open. Um, so caching happens on your computer. Um, and and um, one of the things that happens there as well, that what that means is every time it asks for a page, um, for instance, let's say you refresh, it doesn't necessarily go download the file. 
Um, the first thing it actually does is goes to the server and says, is there anything new? And if the server comes back and says that there's nothing new, it doesn't download it. If it says it hasn't changed specifically, it hasn't been modified since you last downloaded it, it just says, okay, I don't need to download it again. Um, so one of the things we can look at, um, I've got um, a program, uh, a thing called Morgan built into this application here. Um, so if we watch, let me save this so we can get back to start. Um, what you'll see is it's logging every request that gets sent to the server. Um, so it tells you what file, uh, but it also tells you things like how long did it take to serve the file up and, and what status code was returned, right? So let's say I go to this page and just do a simple refresh. Um, if I look at the logs, you can see what files it asked for. Yeah. So it asked for the page. It asked for my bootstrap theme, asked for main CSS, etc. That all makes sense, right? But notice that all of these have this number 304. Do you see that? that status code 304 on each of these yeah. paths, that says that it hasn't changed. So because it hasn't changed, the browser doesn't download it again. It just reuses it. Um, versus if I were to go to the browser, and remember I, I told you that you can do a control F5 to do a hard refresh. Um, so let me hold control and do F5. Um, that will force it to download everything again. So if we look at the logs, You'll notice that everything came back now with a status code of 200, not a status code of 304. See that? Does it save over the previous files or does it create it new saves files? Over. It saves over. It only okay. keep the your cache, um, your local cache only keeps the latest version of it. That's all. Um, so it doesn't keep multiple versions of your CSS files, for instance. It just keeps whatever the latest one is. Um, so that means, for instance, you know, the first time it goes and goes to your website, you see it has to download all these files, and it takes a little bit longer to do all that. Um, but once you go, once you've downloaded the, your JavaScript and your CSS files, I don't have to download them again, right? It just comes back with the free fork code saying, "Yeah, you've got it. You don't need to update it." Cool. Um, so, so the thing to be wary, where there, um, that caching can happen as long as, it, caching all the levels can only happen as long as it's a GET request. Caching doesn't happen at all if it's a POST request. It can't save that result. So, so that caching here, as we were kind of seeing, is on the browser. Um, you can also have caching that happens on the server side. Um, so, for instance, you might say, well, let's, rather than rendering it through handlebars, maybe I want to cache it and um, if, if I want to cache it, maybe I, maybe I um, save the, I, I run it through handlebars, I do the render, but then the next time you ask for that same page, I don't have to re-render it, right? So I can do server caching there. Um, I can also do caching at the database level. Because, for instance, let's say I, I run this method, get all products. Well, how frequently does that data change? How, how frequently does my list of products change? Uh, depends whenever someone puts a new product in. Right. Depends on if somebody puts a new product in. But let's say we only add new products once a month, right? And once a month. Right. Then I probably don't need to run that call to the database every time, right? So I, I can do some caching as well to skip the database access and keep those things in memory. Um, so things where you, you see um, files and stuff cached in memory is generally when you're talking about the server end, uh, not so much on the front end. If you're talking the client side, the browser side, caching generally is, is to files. Um, 
So, you're, so Jonathan, you were asking, is there is there a browser that can load things entirely from cache um, without an internet connection? And the answer is that that Chrome sort of already does that. Um, so you will get an error if, if we stop the server immediately um, because I maybe can't get to pages. Let me see if I kill the server here. Um, so if I try to go to the products page, you'll see that it it fails, right? It timed out because it tried to go to the server and couldn't get it, right? Now let's try something different. All I'm going to do is hit back arrow on this on the browser, right? So I'm on the customer page. I'm just going to hit back and go to the previous page. Remember, my server's still not running. How did it? How did it render this page? My server's not up and running. So typically, anytime you back, do a back arrow with your browser, it's actually usually loading that entirely from cache. It usually only loads it a new thing when you submit a form or, or follow a link. Um, but if I just hit back arrow through my, my pages, I can go back and forward even though my server is not running. Does that answer your question, Jonathan? Um, really, that's down to when you click links and follow through things, that's down to the, it is down to the browser's behavior. Um, and the browser kind of determines whether or not it's gonna try and get the new file or not. In general, I'd say what Chrome does where you all, anytime you click a link, it goes and gets the new thing. That's probably the right approach um, for most cases. Um, I do know that I've seen with um, IE with Internet Explorer, Internet Explorer is a little bit more generous in terms of holding on to things and, and probably honestly too generous. Um, so for instance, if, uh, it, but you can mess with, around with the configuration in Internet Explorer, how it does caching. So if I pull up IE and I go to settings, um, I have to remember where this is. Internet options and browsing history. There it is, settings. Um, so there, the default setting for the caching in IE is automatically, which Chrome then, which IE then tries to be in theory smart about doing that and and potentially could let you do more things without request. Um, but the problem I've had with this being on automatically is a lot of times it doesn't ask for the updated file when it should. Does that follow? Uh, so let me get my server back up and running. So let's just do nodemon. So we're back here. So so caching is an important piece and, 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 and a thing to understand. And the caching really, really becomes valuable when you're doing things like searching because it's very likely if one user is searching for boots, right? What's the likelihood that somebody else is going to also be searching for boots? Like one out of three on this site. It's probably pretty good, right? So uh, it, any, in, in, in general, most searches that users do, it's likely that another user will repeat it. Um, or it's also likely that in that same user will repeat the same search. That actually happens a lot as well. Um, so caching with with searching is is really an important thing to enable 
And if you set it to post, that can't happen versus if you set it to get, it can. Um, okay. So that's, that's, that's the main reason we use get requests is with searching is, is for that um, caching behavior. Um, okay. So let's think about you know what's what's going on here. Let's kind of walk from the the front end to the back end and, and see where where all of this stuff sort of fits together. So on the front end, um, actually, let me just look at it in the browser first. So if I look at the code here, right? So we'll see that there's a form. All right, so you can see that I've got a form, I've given it an ID, and it's got a method of get. See that? Okay. Um, so inside of there, one of the things you might notice, it looks kind of like this search box and the button are kind of one control. Do you see that? How uh, the button's kind of tacked on to the end of the search bar. Um, so the way I do that with Bootstrap is something called an input group. Um, an input group allows you to put multiple controls together. Um, and we can look that up. If I go to components input group, there's an entire page just talking about how you use these input groups. Um, so that's a good thing to kind of look into. Um, because typically that's what we want to do here is we want to say, well, the we'll kind of add the button to the end of the the input field. Um, so input groups lets us do that rather than having them separated as separate controls. Um, so there's a lot of things you can do with that. Most of these examples show you with um, labels that they've added to the beginning and the end. Um, but you can really do this with a, a broad variety of controls. So for instance, here they've got buttons that are at the beginning and end of a field. Um, so that's what I'm using, using there for that input field. Um, you'll also notice that my input field, you see what type it is, type search. Does anybody remember what that type does? What does type search do? I don't recall ever using it. Okay. So I might have mentioned it on a slide, but I don't know if we did an example with it. Um, the gist of it is um, having it type search instead of type text um, on mobile gives it a, a different button. Um, gives it a different button to the enter key. No, I found this the other day. Um, so here's that's kind of what changes is this button here. Normally it would be enter, it turns to the spyglass. See that? So so making it type search is largely for the sake of mobile. Cool. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind there. Um, Beneath that, you'll also see that I've got some what we would call filters, right, to filter the data down. So I can say, well, I only want to see buckles, so I can pick buckles and, and go there. Now I only have buckles, or I could pick hats and only get hats. So these are what we refer to as, as filters. Um, and you can have a lot of different filters. You might have a filter like this for the category. You might have a filter for a price range to say that price has to be between this range and that range. Or if you're dealing with event data, it might be between, you know, it has to be in this, in this date range. Um, so things you might see there. Um, you also see that I have a drop down here as well for saying how many results do I want to see on a page. Um, so I can say, well, I want 10 results per page, 20 results per page, which results in, in fewer pages, or well, let's just have 100 items per page and results in there they're all being on one page. Um, so those are the kind of inputs that we're seeing here. Okay. Um, 
You also notice that I have a paging control here. I want to talk a little bit about how I built that and some of the pieces that go into that. Um, but there are any questions on the, the front end side of this. Uh, the main new thing being the, the input group. Okay, you can go with no. So let's walk back from there. Okay, so if you're looking at that view, this would be views, products, list. Um, so the form that's implementing that is here. Um, oh, one thing I might mention, you'll see that I have a field set and a legend around most of the content in the form. Actually, all the content in the form. So the field set um, and the legend, what they do is they create this bar, this border here. So a field set is to group uh, a set of uh, fields together. Um, and you can then style them that way. And then the legend is what's appearing here is that word search. Now, the reason it's appearing that way is because I've got a little bit of, of custom CSS, um, which is norm. Uh, the browser actually has has some of that built in by default, um, but Bootstrap actually turns off some of the default styling, so I had to kind of add it back in. Um, so what I'm doing with that, you can look at main CSS and you can kind of see what I'm what I'm doing there. I'm just applying a border and, and messing around with margins and and such. Um, I did have to set the width to auto um, so that it doesn't take up the entire width of this and that's why you can see it's just taking up the little piece there cool yep um, so that's that's how that styling gets there the 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 border around that in the text um, that is your your field set and your your legend um, that's how i'm getting that okay so going back here um, so when i submit the form um, you'll notice that I haven't specified an action, right? Um, well, normally you want to specify an action. This is a case where it's okay to not specify an action. What is the action if I don't specify it, though? Where does it send to? The root, maybe? Not the root. So I'm not doing anything fancy with Ajax right with this form. You'll notice that when I just go here, right? Where am I at? Slash product, right? Yeah. When I hit search, where does it go? What route is it going to? A search route somewhere. What's the actual route? Because this is all query parameters, which is not part of the route. It's the same page. It's the same page, right? So if you have a form that you don't specify the action on, it just posts the same page. Um, so that's what's happening here with all of these. If I hit search, it just goes to the same page, which is really what I want with a search form, is I want it to really submit to the same place where we started at in general. Um, is that always the rule? Not always, but most of the time that will be what you want is with the search interface, it's generally going to submit to the same place where you started. Um, it, obviously, if you put the search interface into like the nav bar, then you would need to specify an action and tell it where to go. Uh, but you don't technically don't have to. So because this is in, in slash product, it's, it's posting back to slash product. Um, so if I go to the route for that product, um, I've got this route needs to actually handle two things. It needs to handle both the, the page when I initially see it and the page when I do a search. Does that, does that make sense? Because it's the same route, right? I'm using the route to, to show the initial version of the list plus the searched or filtered version of the list. Cool. 
Um, so if I were to look at the, the individual fields on the form, right, I would see that those fields, um, the category dropdown is named category, the search box is named search, um, the page size dropdown is named page size. Okay, um, That's the name of the field on that form, right? So you can see name search, name category, name page size. And remember, normally when, our, when we're pulling that out, right, with the post request, where do we pull it from? We pull it from request.body, right? Um, but because these, this is a get request and it's getting added to the URL, the path to that is not request.body, it's request.query. That's how you get to your query string. Everybody with me? Yeah. No, not falling asleep? Not quite. Not, not trying to put you asleep. Um, so the if you want to get things from the URL and from a get request, it's going to be request.query and then the name of the field um, rather than request.body. Okay. Um, so that's that's what's happening here. Um, so the category in search, I'm just grabbing literally. Now you'll notice with the page size and the page number, I'm doing a little bit more logic, right? Um, so I'm calling parse int, but then I also have this or, right? Well, well, what does the parse int do? The parse int takes the the input, which always comes to us as a string. If I input it into a, a form field, it always comes to us as a string and tries to turn it into a number. Does that make sense? Yeah. And the reason I need to make sure I do that is because I want to later do math with it. Um, so if it's if it's still as a as a string, I won't be able to do math with that number. Got it? Yeah. Um, so I need to make sure it's actually turned into a number. And then I'm also saying or 10. So remember that's a fallback to say if you don't specify a page size, here's the default value, right? So if you give me a page size of, of ABC or not a page size at all, then we'll use 10 as the default page size. And if you don't specify which page you're on, we'll assume that you're on page one. Cool? Um, so what that means is if I go to this page initially, right, I'm just going to slash product, you'll notice I don't have any query parameters in my location right in my URL see that so so what are all my query parameters going to be at this point the first time I go here all category search etc be huh the, the default okay what like 10, they... 10 one I see that part that's already given okay what will these be what will these be if I don't specify them? Undefined. Definitely undefined. Yep. Similar to like if you don't submit a, a form right with a post, right? If you do request.body and it's not there, you're going to get undefined. So initially, category and search are going to be undefined. And if I hadn't done this logic with it, then the the request.peri.page size would be undefined and quest.query.page, all, all four of those are gonna be undefined initially. Cool? Um, so I need to make sure that I, I put some logic around to check if those values are actually there. That's how I'm dealing with the page size and the page number, um, but I'll have to do something different with the category and the search fields, okay? Um, the next thing you'll see in here is I'm building up this category option list object um, and I'm using that to populate my dropdown list. Um, so in order to pop down, populate my dropdown list, which is a, a select tag, um, I need to know two things. I need to know, first of all, which option is selected, and I need to know what the options are, right? Yeah. Um, so there's, there's all the data that I need. Um, so I need to, I, I've got the selected as category, and if you haven't specified a category, I'm gonna use empty string as the selected, uh, because that means all, as you kind of see here. Um, 
And then options, this is, this is an array. Each of these objects have a value in a text. Um, now, the place that I use that, um, I'm going to kind of skip over what I have here in a minute um, and come back to it. Um, when I render the view, you'll see that I pass on that option list. See that? I pass on that object to the, the view as category option list. Cool? So if we look at the view, and by the way, if you want to look at this code as well, it's this is the same example that we were looking yesterday, but I have made some changes. So you'll make sure you pull down um, the newest code. Um, if I look for that, you'll see my select, and you see character or option list there. Um, so the way I've gone about generating that dropdown is I've used a, a partial view, right? You can see the, the little greater than there. So I'm using a partial view to generate that that dropdown because there's a bit of logic that um, you need to actually make it work. Cool. Yep. Um, so if you want to dig into how I'm generating that, um, the code for that is here. Um, if you want to refer to that, um, and but that's where that is. Um, Okay, so that's the, the options. What's happening there is that's my list for the dropdown, right? That's the generate the dropdown. The next thing I need to do is I need to build up and execute the query that actually goes to the database, okay? Um, so the first thing I'm doing is I'm calling this database.getAllProducts, right? Um, and, and if I dig into, into that, right, remember get all products. It's just a, a very simple query. I just say, give me everything, right? Um, but remember, this gives me effectively a query builder. Um, this query hasn't been executed yet, so I can actually add more onto the query, and this is where the, the query becomes more dynamic um, before I actually execute it. Okay, um, so far we've been just saying, okay, we'll get all products and, and immediately await it. Um, what I'd like to do is, is add, add some additional clauses to it before I execute that query. So I can save that query to a variable. You see I'm saving it to the variable name query, right? Um, and then I've got some logic. So I'm saying if, if the user has picked a category from the dropdown, then I'm going to add in a where clause that checks for that category. Do you see that? So I'm dynamically building this query out. Okay, it's not just the where clause in there all the time. Cool? very quiet in here it's very quiet <laughs> sorry so so i'm filtering it for the category um, if the user has selected a category um, and in general this kind of trick that you can use with with almost any sort of where clause that you might want to add so i say if the user has picked something filter it and then you'll see i'm saving it back to the query variable, right? So I'm adding things onto it, saving it back. Next thing you'll see, I'm saying, well, if they've entered some search keywords, we also want to add another where clause, right? You remember if I call where multiple times, it ands it together, right, from yesterday? So, so here I said where the, the category is equal to the category the user picked. Here I'm doing something a little bit interesting. So I'm using where raw, right? So, and the reason I need to use where raw for this is because the, the way that you do a full text search in um, MySQL, um, MySQL's got some, some tools, some, some bits of language that are not standard SQL, um, but make it so you can do full text search and do it efficiently and do it quickly. Okay, so you'll if you remember right when we go if we were to look at our schema um, and look at the products table, 
you remember that we added earlier, we added this full text index over the name and the category. You see that? Um, so that full text index is required to do this kind of search. Okay, so we've indexed name and category. Okay, um, so when I go back here, I'm going to be using that index. I don't use it by name, but I use it because I'm saying match these fields, name and category, which is what I've defined in my index, against question mark in natural language. Um, so in natural language, there's if you look at the spec, there's a few different options that you can put there. Um, that's the one that, that um, I think is probably going to be generally the one you want. Um, but there's a few different ways that you can run the query. Um, so you remember that I talked about this question mark in, in using that with raw queries yesterday? What was the what was that question mark for? Placeholder. It's a placeholder, right? So it's a placeholder for the search. Okay. So I'm using that to inject search in there, but avoiding um, any sort of SQL injection flaws. Right. I could have put that directly in here with a template string, um, but then I would be opening myself up to, to SQL injection. Right. Okay, so that's my search. Um, and one of the other things that you get, um, if you do a where clause like this using a full text search, it actually automatically reorders your results to be based on relevance. Okay. or how many of the words that you entered match up with the things that you find. Um, so we can see that, for instance, if I go look for um, dog boots, we'll see this, this result comes up first because it has both dog and boots in it, right? You see that? Or if I type in, in African boots, Um, I'll see the, the, the two results that have African come up the, come up first, um, but the one that has both of those words comes up as the very first. Um, so it uses those, those keywords to determine the relevance of the search results. You with me? Mm -hmm. um, now I lose that ordering if I introduce an order by clause. Um, which is where I've actually removed, there used to be an order by clause here. I pulled that out. Um, so I only add in the order by clause here, ordering by name, if we're not doing a keyword search, if we're not doing a full text search. You see that? So we either do a full text search if you've given me some keywords, but if you've not given me a keywords, then we want to order the results by name. Questions? Uh, is, no, sir. Huh? Uh, no, sir. Okay. So this is new, um, and this is specific to MySQL. That's how you do, uh, you perform a, mul uh, a full text search. Um, other, other database engines do have some full text capabilities, but the, the syntax from, from database to database is, is different, and that's part of why you have to do where raw instead of specifying it as... Um, the where. Um, okay, so we do all that. We'll come back to the pager thing in a minute. Um, and then in order to, to actually execute it, I built up this query, right, with this logic, but I haven't actually executed the query yet. Um, so what I need to do is to actually get the products, I need to say await on the query. Right, so wait on the query is what actually goes and executes it. Cool? Uh, or I could do then if I was working with promises. Um, now you'll notice when I execute the query, you see how I'm adding the limit and the offset clauses that we talked about yesterday? Um, so that's going to give me just a single page of results. So I say limit to the page size. So initially that's 10 results. So I'm saying only give me 10 results 
and then I'm using the offset here calculation to figure out which page of results it's going to give me back. Okay, um, so if we kind of walk through that that calculation, so I'm saying page size, I need to multiply that in there because okay, every page has 10 results, um, so I need to know I need to go by that number of rows. Um, and then I'm also saying multiply that by page number minus one. Why is that, why might that minus one be there? Why do I need to say subtract one? Well, if you're on page two, then mm -hmm. two minus one mm -hmm. is one times 10. So you would get the offset of the 10. So you would start okay. at 11. Okay. So offset of 10 for page two. What about page, what about the first page? Is it because it's in like an array and it starts at zero? So yes, when we're talking about offsets, it starts at zero. Our offset is zero based, but our page number is starts at one. Does that make sense? So our page numbers start at one, but our offset starts at zero. Um, so that's where I'm subtracting one so that the first, because the first page number is one, but I need that to be, be zero for the first page. Cool? So if our first page was page zero, I wouldn't need to do the minus one. But because our first page is page one, which is kind of the norm, um, then I need to, to subtract one in there. Now, let me ask you this. What happens if I remove these parentheses that I've got here? Are those parentheses important? What happens if I do that? And it does the multiplication first. Does the multiplication first and then subtracts one, right? Will that give you a different answer? So the right answer is that will give you a completely different answer. So make sure when you're when you're putting in the, the calculation there, make sure you include those parentheses. Cool? Those those parentheses are not optional because you need the, the subtraction to happen first before the multiplication. Okay, so so once I've got the products, I can pass that back to the view, and, and that we kind of understand. Um, so so that's kind of walking through um, the the different parts with the searching. Um, you'll also notice that the inputs that we have, right, category and search, I'm passing these things back to the view. Do you see that? Category and search, I'm passing those back to the render. Why might I need to pass those values back to the view? Bueller. Um, so let's say let's say let's say I just comment these out, right? Let's say I comment out the search and I don't pass the search back. Okay. I would expect if I type in a value here for it to be kept, right? So if I type in votes and hit search, if I don't send it back to the view, you see how the fields got cleared out? Yeah. So I need to send it back to the view in order for me to put the value back in there into the field. Um, so if we look at the search field, you see how I'm setting the value to that search, the search value from the previous request. Yeah. Um, so I need that. I need that there to keep the the values that you've selected previously in there. Um, if you don't pass that in, then anytime the user tries to do a search, um, then all of these fields will reset back to where they were. Um, but I'd like it to be um, if I say boots or maybe you say. Um, Break boots 
20 items per page. I'd like all of those values to stay there, right? So I need to somehow pass them back to the view. Any questions on searching? So the, the big part of that is, is that you can use the query builder and to add additional stuff before you actually execute the query. Any questions there? Uh, I do have a question about something else with the handlebars. I see you've got them organized into folders. Uh -huh. So all you had there is in the routes. Mm -hmm. it, uh, when you render the page, you just put in the, the link, right? That's it. Okay. Yep. So it's okay. it's the list view inside of product folder. So I just when I render, I say product slash list. That's it. Um, and that just keeps my views all all organized, um, rather than have everything floating around at the the root. Questions? Anything? So we've gone over basic searching, right? Yeah. Um, I didn't talk about paging yet. Um, so the way I'm doing paging, and, and there's more than one way to, one way to implement this. Um, uh, I would, I'm going to go over some of the code. I won't go over all of it, I don't think, um, simply because there is quite a lot um, to actually make paging working, making paging working work um, as far as things go. Um, the place to start when you're looking at paging is we're using bootstrap here so so we want to use um, some of the, the controls that bootstrap provides well bootstrap's got a control they call the pagination control see this yeah so if you go under components and look up pagination they'll give you the code to generate one of these um, so it, it, the basic syntax of that it's got a nav tag on the outside um, you've got an unordered list and, and then each is the list item with links um, so so this is kind of a, a code example with it um, but I'd like to effectively generate this with code I don't want to have to hard code my my now my my uh, paging control right I want that to be generated dynamically which is my kind of objective, right? So you can see how I've got the paging control here. That's what I've built and, and how I've made it look. Um, in there, you kind of see that there's some, but there's the page number, but there's also some buttons on the end, right? And so, so normally when you see paging controls, you're gonna see buttons, a pair of buttons at the beginning and the end. What do these usually do? Any guesses what those usually do? What are I these buttons? Huh? I can't really see them. What are they? Okay. Uh, let's see if I can make things bigger. So we've got the paging buttons here. You see them? Uh, the single arrow usually goes by one, and then uh -huh. the double is like a set number. I don't know. Okay. I think it's two or ten. Yeah, you could do it. Mul you can do it more than one way. Um, the way I've implemented these is the single arrow takes you one step, so the previous page or the next page. Um, the the double arrow takes you all the way to the end, the double or all the way to the beginning. Um, but you could say we'll go by ten pages. Um, I've seen both of those approaches. Cool. Um, so that's what those buttons are. Um, so the way I, I know that I want to include this pager, I know I want to include it um, potentially multiple places. So for instance, I probably want to include the pager at the top of the page and the pager at the bottom of the page. You see that? I'm sure you've seen websites that a lot of websites that do that. Yeah. Have the pager at the top and the bottom. Um, and I also want to have that pager on all of these lists. So I want to have it on the customers page, I want to have the orders page, I want to have the products page. So as I build out that pager, I'd like it to be as much as possible, I'd like it to be reusable code, right? I want it to be adaptable to whatever list I'm working with, right? 
Um, so one thing that then speaks to, does it make sense to put it directly into your view? If I want to reuse this, what could we use? What we what could we use to make this code reusable? By putting it in like a template, your layout. Okay, in my layout. No, 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 no. Like, uh, I don't know how to explain it. So we've talked about one technique. I talked about this yesterday, and we saw it again today. Remember, there's this idea of a partial. Right, so if I if I put that into a partial, then I can use it multiple times. So for instance, if I look at my list page, remember I've got that pager at the top and the bottom. Well, here's the pager for the top of the page. Here's the pager for the bottom of the page. Same code, right? Questions on that? So what were you saying? Okay, so we've got a partial here, and we've got the name of the partial is pager. The data that I'm passing into it is, is a pager object. Okay. Does that does that kind of make sense for, for why I want to do that as a partial to, to reuse it? Yeah. Okay. So so on the front end I've got this pager page or partial that I can reuse on all of these pages and I can even have it you know multiple places in the page like top and bottom like I have it okay so let's look at some of the stuff what's what's happening in that partial view um, so we saw the basic code that the bootstrap provided um, and that kind of informs how we build this out um, so let's start at the top so um, first thing I have in here is I'm saying well if pages so if there are any pages then we want to render the content here but if for you know if if there are no pages then we won't render the the pager at all that's what this check is about um, so if you see if I were to say I want to get a hundred items per page everything ends up all on one page you see the pager disappears from both the top and the bottom do you see that yeah. Similarly, if I if I say, well, let's search for for test, well, nothing comes back, so the pager disappears. Um, so that's that's what that check is about. So I'm saying, if there are no pages, then then don't render it. Okay. So that's how I'm dealing with with that case. Um, so if there's no pages, there's then no don't do any of the code we have here. But if we do have pages, start rendering. So on the outside, I've got the nav tag, right? So the nav bounds this. You remember the nav tag, the reason for that, the semantics is saying this is a navigation section, right? So your pager is, is something that navigates you around the website, right? Um, so that's why we typically put it in a nav tag. Um, but the nav tag otherwise, besides its semantic meaning, basically behaves like a div. Um, it's a block element. Um, you'll notice I'm doing a little bit of flexbox on there. Um, I'm making a flexbox and justify content end. Um, all that does is it takes our our links and it moves them over to be right aligned. Cool. Um, without that, my pager would be on the left. Um, so I can, if I want to maybe change that, maybe that doesn't work for me. Um, I could change this to start. I could change this to center, right? That would get me my pages center aligned. Um, so you can very quickly just, just change a little bit there if you want to change what the alignment is. Um, but notice that that's changing it across the entire site anywhere I use this pager. Cool. Um, so I have a few different things coming in here. UL needs to have that class of pagination. That's what we pulled out from the example. Um, and then I've got a few different buttons. So remember I have a button or a link for the first page. I have a link for the previous page. I've got um, each of the pages in between and then I've got a next and a last at the end. Um, so let's let's look at the the way that the first page is linked is working. Um, so I, I have this property called first URL. So I say 
if there's a if there is a um, and this is data I'm effectively passing to the view. If I have a first URL, um, a URL to the first page, then let's show it this way. If there's not, then it will be disabled. Um, so for instance, you can see if I go to, if I'm on the first page, you see how these two, when I hover over it, nothing happens? Yeah. Right? So those buttons are both disabled when I'm on the first page. And if I'm on the last page, these two buttons are disabled. Um, because there's, there's no point in using them if you're already at the first or already at the last. Um, so that's that's where I'm checking that. So if it is if it is there, um, we get, have a, an LI with the class of page item, page page link. You can see the href is that first URL. I'm doing the ARIA label. That's for screen readers so that they can read the actual text there. Um, and then inside of that, I've got my icon. Okay. And I'm saying area hidden so that the screen reader doesn't read that because they're going to read this instead, right? This Goulomet wouldn't make any sense for the screen reader. Cool? Um, so do you remember what this is? What does that look like? It starts with the ampersand, ends with a semicolon. It's like, it's like what we do with the copyright symbol. Like what we do with the copyright symbol. You're right. What do we call that? If I wanted to Google and find these, what would I what would I need to look for? Because if I look for copyright symbol, I probably won't find it. I might find it, but I probably won't. What are those called? I feel like it's at the tip of my tongue. I just can't remember. Okay. Um, so the thing to remember is, is if it starts with an ampersand and ends with a semicolon, those kind of things are what we refer to as, as entities, HTML entities. Um, so there's a few different places you can read up on them. Uh, W3C schools has a, has a table of the different entities. Um, and if we, I think, well, well, this is not the, well, this is not the table I was looking at. This is partial table. Um, so they give a few examples, but I swear that, um, where is the full page of this? HTML entities, symbols, and I was looking at this. Um, how did I get to that page? LA quote. Ah, there's the full list. Um, so you can you can look up a lot of them here. Um, there's more than one way to specify them. You can specify a lot of the common ones using these these shorthands, um, but you can also specify them as either decimal or their their hex codes. Um, so if we look at, for instance, that one in one of these, you can see this says um, right pointing double angle quotation mark. That's kind of where those letters come from. Um, or the other one with the S is right single. Um, so, so that's where if you wanted to look these up, that's that's kind of where I pulled those codes from. Um, the Bootstrap example has some of those in there as well. If you look down further, they talk about using icons. Um, but that's, that's what I'm using. Um, okay, so you have the enabled version, you have the disabled version. In order to disable it, there's a few things that you need to change. Um, so first of all, you'll notice that it has the disabled class. So the page item has the disabled class. Um, you'll also notice it has tab index negative one. Uh, tab index negative one says that it can't be accessed through keyboard X, keyboard tabbing. So if I tab through, I'll, it won't tab to the, um, the disabled controls, and that's why that exists there. 
and disable this to tell the, the screen readers that this item is disabled as well. Um, so those are the attributes that I had to add and, and I put that in for each of these. So for the most part, the, the first, the previous, the, the next, the last, they're all basically the same thing, just with a different icon. Okay. Uh, so the interesting one in the middle is I loop through this pages array and generate a, a link for each page. Right. So, so I've got a loop there. We generate a page item and a page link. Um, and we can kind of look at what I'm doing as far as, as generating that. Um, you can tell from this that I'm expecting each link to have two properties, a URL and a text. You see that? So the text is the, is the text that the user sees, and the URL is where it goes when the user clicks on the link. Polly, do you have something to say? Uh, no, I didn't say anything. Okay. I, I'm curious why you call it a loop, though. I'm not seeing that part of it. Well, the, the each. Oh, okay. okay. Right, the each is a loop. So I'm looping through each page. Right, so that's where I get all of the, the pages in between. Um, you'll notice I'm doing this. I've added another helper um, for a ternary uh, because what I needed was for it to say... Um, ternary, so the first argument is the condition, then A or B, because what I needed to do was say, well, if it is the active link, um, then I want to, if it is active, then add the active class, otherwise, uh, otherwise don't add a class. Um, so that marks, marks um, which link is active, and that's where you can see as I go through, you can see which page I'm on is because one of them has the active class. Cool? Okay, so, so what, does that, what does that mean for the data? So we know that in order to use this view, I need a few things. I need an array of pages. I need a first URL, a previous URL, next URL, last URL. Um, and each of the pages, by the way, should have an active Boolean URL and a text. So it should have that data. Okay, so in order to build that up, um, I've taken a lot of the, the logic to, to build that pager and I've stuffed it in this, in this file called pagerutils, okay? Um, so with the pagerutils, that's, that's where I'm saying, well, we need to, gen we need to do a lot of calculations with, with the pieces. Uh, the place I call that, um, if I look in the, the product route, right? So we built up the query, right? Built up the query, and we talked about here's where we execute that query, right? Um, but in, the, in between, I construct the pager. And the reason I need to do it in between is because I need to know how many results are there in the entire result set, not just how many results are in the pager. So if I had built the, if I had done the, the calculation afterward here, I wouldn't know how many pages that there are. Does that follow? So I need to do that before we say limit and offset. Cool? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I need to know, for instance, there's 99 results, so that means that there's 10 pages. Okay, so to the pager, I'm passing a few things. This, this pager utils get pager method. Um, I'm passing a few things. I'm passing the query, the query that we're going to execute. I'm ex passing what the page size is, what the current page number is, and this request.original URL. So that gives us quest.original URL is the URL that we're currently on. Um, and we'll use that as a starting point to figure out the URL for each page. Cool. Um, so those are all pieces of data I need to figure out and build out um, the data needed for the pager itself. Okay. So let's go look and get pager. Um, so this is how I built it. Um, this is obviously not the only way to do this. 
Um, but I wanted to give you an example of, of how you can kind of break this code out and, and make a pager that's reusable. Um, cool. So I take in those, those different fields. You'll notice that I've got a little documentation on here on the function. Um, that's what we refer to, that's, that's JS doc or JavaScript documentation. That's the way you write it. Um, so there's a little description of the function and I specify what each of the parameters are and uh, what data type they need to be. So for instance, page size and, and such needs to be a number. Um, and then it eventually it's going to return a, a promise to an object. Okay, um, so that can be really helpful to to document things, especially things like this where you're going to reuse it um, to know what the expected input types and things like that are going to be. Okay, um, I'm doing this as just a quick check just to make sure yes, our page size and our page number are good. Um, in theory, that's already been done in the route and, and I could potentially remove those. Uh, but that's just for safety to make sure that this is isolated from uh, other errors that may happen elsewhere. Um, so the first thing I need to do to build out the pagers, I need to know how many results there actually are, right? Uh, so I'm going to use the query and use a little bit of uh, trickery to, to get that number, okay? So you see I'm calling the, the get count method. So, so here I'm here. This is kind of how I would go about counting the number of results there is as a whole. Um, the way I'm going to implement this, remember I mentioned that you can do things like subqueries, um, where you have a query inside of a query. Um, so effectively, what you can do is you can treat any SQL, any select query, as a table, right? Because effectively, every select query generates a result set that behaves like a table, right? So in here, my get count method, I'm saying, well, let's go to connects, which is our uh, db.connects, which I've exposed the, the connects object from the, the database module. Um, so this is basically our database connection. And then I'm saying from from Q query. So query, remember, is the is the query that we're executing to get all of our search results, but I'm aliasing it as, as Q. So when you use it in a from, you have to give it an alias. I'm not actually going to use that Q anywhere, but I have to give it an alias, otherwise you get an error. Cool? So I'm treating that query as a table. Everybody with me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm treating it as a table. Um, and then I'm saying count, count the number of rows in that table effectively. Um, and, and I need to do it as a sub. The reason I need to do it as a subquery is because we've already got select earlier in this. So if I did this with, especially if we have group by and other things going on, then I would get this column plus other columns. Um, or if I have group bio, would getting, be getting multiple counts, but I need the count of the whole thing. Um, so that's that's why I'm doing it as a subquery. So I'm saying uh, use it. Yeah. Uh, uh, up one fifty one. Why just Q? Why Q colon query? Um, that's the name I'm giving the alias I'm giving the table. That Q doesn't. What you name it doesn't matter. I could name this you unicorn. Um, unicorn and it wouldn't matter in this case. Or you could just have nothing, right? And just type query. I can't have nothing. Um, I can't have nothing because in order to do a subquery in a from clause in SQL, you have to give that an alias. You have to name that. Um, so basically, because I'm treating it like a table, I have to give that 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 table a name. Does that follow? Yeah. Um, let's let me jump over to MySQL and we can talk about how this actually looks in SQL. Um, ignore that for a minute. Let's 
So, so say I've got my inner results might look something like select star from products. Okay, so let's say that's my list of results, right? So I want to use this, this results as a table. So the way I write that, I'm saying select, let's say we say select star or select count star. And then I'm saying from, and remember from, we would normally have a table name in there. That's where I'm substituting this. So if I run this query as is, you'll see that I get this error. Every derived table must have its own alias. Do you see that error? So because, huh? Yes. So that's the error I'm trying to avoid which is where I'm giving this a name of Q. Q is the name of that table. And then it's happy. So that avoids that error is, is I just need to give it an alias because otherwise my, my subquery doesn't have a name. But the name there doesn't really matter. If I was going to do more logic with this subquery, I might need, I might care about what that name is. Um, but I'm just calling it Q because, well, that name's not taken. I know it won't be taken because um, I'm not going to call it table Q. Um, so, so that's I'm just doing an alias. Say count, count the number of rows. We know that that then returns a single row, so I'm just saying first. And then from there, from the first row, I'm extracting the, all I want is the, the row count column so I can throw all the rest away. So what this ends up producing is just a single number, which is how many rows are in the result set. Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, where, does, where does row come from? That's just another word for results, right? Yeah. Well, I know okay. in this case, because I've done dot first, that I'm only getting a single row. Um, but this name here can be whatever. Remember, this is a lambda. So what the name is doesn't really, doesn't really matter. But it is a single row. So that's why I'm calling it row. Cool. I could call it yeah. what, I could have called that Y and it would be fine. Uh, so. Okay. Uh, uh, tell me again, line 58 and 59. Mm -hmm. are, oh, it's commented out. So it's just, just for informational purposes. Let's yeah. See that so, out. so this is, this is, this is just a comment on this next function here. Same way this 44 through 48 is a comment on the get count function. Got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm. Tr I'm just trying to get the the big picture with all these files here uh -huh. at the beginning. So we got pager dot utils. We got product. How many uh, different files are thrown into this? Um, and then there, a lot. But the only two, the two that matter for the kind of the pager are, uh, we've got the partial view and we've got this this file. The, okay, yeah, I know the search part's big, but just right. for the pagination, we just got two. Yeah, it's really just those two that, that do most of the grunt work. Um, there is a little bit of logic in product if you if you pay attention to the route, like we're getting the those two values, passing them on to this function, and then passing the pager on to the, um, passing that on to the, uh, the view, but the the main grunt work is between the the partial view and the this utils file, this pager utils file. That's where most of the code is. Um, so that's that's the logic that I use to to generate the count. So the one of the things that we haven't seen there before is I'm using a subquery, and so that's one way you can you can introduce a subquery into connects. Okay, so, so that's all just to get the number of rows that we have, which tells us how many rows, how many um, rows are in the result set, which, which we can use to determine how many pages they're going to be. 
Um, so again, I need that because I, I otherwise I just have, well, this page has five things on it. Well, that doesn't tell me how many pages there should be. I need to know the total number. Um, so then I start building the pager object, which is what's actually gonna go back to the view. Um, in that pager object, I'm adding the count, the page size, and the page number, in case I need to use those other values anywhere. Um, I'm also adding this, this page size options. We'll, we'll look at that in a little bit. Um, but that's just a list of, that's just for my dropdown of, of page size. The page size dropdown um, is what that's about. Um, so the main grunt work of that, of, of this method, of this function, is to then loop through and create the pages. Um, so one of the things I do here, I say, if the count is greater than the page size, well, why do I care if the count is greater than the page size? Well, if the count's not greater than the page size, that means we have just one page. Got it? If the count, if the total number of rows in the result set is not greater than the size of a page, that means we just have a single page of results. Um, so in that case, basically, I don't want to set up any of the things that we're setting up here, which is mean is is going to mean that the pager doesn't show up. Got it? You tracking with me? Yeah. Um, so that's why I'm doing this check is to make sure that the pager doesn't show up. If I took this check out and we had just a single page of results, um, so let's say I do test, or wait a minute, did I, did I do that right? Oh, no, I need a, a single page of results. I need at least one result there. Um, so if I have just one result here, you can see where it's still showing the pager, right? Um, and and that can work, that can be okay, but but oftentimes, you know, if there's single page, you probably don't need to show the pager. Um, so I'm skipping all that logic in that case. Um, so then I'm gonna go build up the, the array of pages, which is that each loop, remember, in the middle of our, of our partial, so the array of pages, I start with initially with, with um, an empty array, and then I'm gonna add pages gradually to it, okay? Um, so I've got a for loop, a traditional for loop in here, because um, that ends up making the most sense for this. Um, you'll notice though I'm doing something a little bit different than what you might normally do. Do you notice that my, my loop, I actually have two loop variables? See, I've got I and I've got P. Yeah. So why do I need two different counters? Well, I need one that's counting the page number and I need another, I want another counter that's gonna be counting the row number. Um, you could do this with, with a single counter, but it, it, it turns out it's a lot easier to write it with two counters. Got it? Um, so basically the, the P is going to be going up by one and the, the I will be going up by the page size. So we start I at one, we start P at, we start I at zero, P at one. So we're at row zero, page one. Okay. Um, I'm going to loop as long as the row number is less than the count. Do you see that? So I'm looping through each page, and each each step I'm incrementing i by the page size, but I'm only incrementing p by by one. Do you see that? You understand why that kind of makes that easy to work work the math out having two different counters. I think so. Um, so for each page, I'm creating a page object. You'll see I'm doing pager.pages.push. Push is a method on the array object which says add another thing. So if you want to add things to an array, you say push. Um, so that will put it to, on the end of the array. Um, so for each page, I'm creating this object here. Um, so the page needs a URL, right? So I've got a method there that takes the, the base URL plus the page number and we'll figure out 
um, what that URL is. The text of the page, I'm going to just use the page number itself. See, text colon P. And then I'm going to say it's active if, if that page number is equal to the page we're on. So P is equal to page number. So that gives me a, a true or a false. Got it? Any questions with that? Uh, yeah, I'm not getting line 23. Line 23. I'm, I'm, looking at, I'm looking at 16 through 20. I see count, page size, mm -hmm. page number, pager dot pages. Mm -hmm. I'm just not getting that. And so it's an array. It's another attribute within that, along with count, page size, and all yeah. that. So I'm adding a, the the pages attribute, the pages property, to the page, the pager object. Um, so I'm setting pages okay. to an empty array. I'm initializing that array. So okay. That's all I'm doing is I'm creating an empty array. Because yeah, the pages dot pages didn't exist until then. Correct. Dot pages would have been undefined. At this point, pager dot pages was undefined. Um, so I'm defining it in adding and in setting it to an empty array. Um, if I didn't do this line of code, then this would fail because I'd be trying to push something to undefined, right? Pages would be undefined. With me? Yeah, yeah, I got it. Yeah. Okay. And, and the reason I'm leaving it undefined out here is because I want to keep that check in the partial view simple. Um, if I initial, if I define the page, the um, if I define the array here um, on line 16, um, if I define that array, then I have to go check the length of the array back in, and to check the length of the array back in the partial view, which makes the whole check a lot more complicated, actually. Cool. Okay. All right. So that's the reason I'm not defining it here, is because it makes it easier to to check whether or not there are pages back in the partial view. Okay. So we loop through, recreate the array of pages, um, and then I'm going to say, well, let's say is it pay if it's not the first page, then I want to generate links for the first URL and the and the previous URL. So first URL is the URL for page one. Um, and previous URL is going to be page number minus one. Does that make sense? Questions? It's very quiet in here. I don't know if that's that's because people are listening or, or tuning out or, or what the case is. I'm just very quiet. I apologize. Okay. Maybe I maybe I'm expecting more questions than I should be. Anyway, so so that's what I'm doing, and then for the last one, the the index of the last page is is pages dot length, so um, that will be the last one, and that works because um, our page numbers are based at one. Um, if our if our first page was page zero, then this would be pages dot length minus one. Um, so to last, if the page number is is less than the last page, then we want to. If it's not at the last page, then we want to find those two links. So the the last URL will be the the link to the last page, and next URL will be page number plus one. Okay. So that's how I build up the the data I need for the pager, and you can see how that's kind of easily reusable, right? Does that follow? Does that make sense? Yeah. So so I can reuse this this method to to build up the pager for any sort of page where I want a pager because I need to get the I have the the partial view that represents how the how it's displayed, but I have this logic to figure out how to build that how to do the calculations necessary. Um, now um, let's look quickly at get page URL and how I do that, how, how we might do that logic. 
So in get page URL, I take two things. I take the base URL of, of where you are currently and the page number, okay? So, so with the URL, um, I want to basically swap out or change the URL in such a way that it has the page number in it. Um, now there's a few different cases. I'm going to use a regular expression here and I'm going to basically deal with it as a string. Um, there are other, other tools you can use potentially to work with URLs. I, I tried those and this, this seemed to be the easiest, end up being just going back to strings, seemed, ended up being the easiest way to solve this problem. Um, so what I'm saying is, um, let's first of all define a, a regular expression, which is what I'm looking for. So I say where the, I'm going to look in the URL and look for page is equal to blah, right? So it would normally be something like page is equal to three, page is equal to one, etc., right? Anybody remember what slash D does? Digit. It's a digit. And what does the plus do? Isn't it any number of digits? Okay, sort of. You're close. Uh, the star would be any number. More than one. One or more. One or, one or more. more. So, so plus says one or more digits. Um, so that means if it's it's page equals 10, page equals 20, page equals 5, um, I'll catch all of those cases. So I'm looking for somewhere in the URL where it says page is, is that. Um, so if we think about that here, um, I could try that, for instance, and say page is equal to, page is equal to 2. All I've really got to do to change it from page two to page three is change it to page three, right? So if I just replace that where it says page two with page three, I've changed the URL, right? Um, the reason I'm doing it the way I'm doing it though is because I oftentimes will have other pieces of information in there, right? So I need to keep, for instance, what category did the user pick um, and what did the user type in the search bar? If I lose those things, then I would go back to the first page of search results. Does that make sense? So I need more things in the URL than just the page number. Got it? Yeah. Now, the way it comes down, there's, there's kind of three cases that we can be in. So the first case we can be in is if that's somewhere in the URL, I'm, I'm finding it if it's somewhere in the URL and saying regex.test. So I'll return true if it finds page, page equals page, page equals a number somewhere in the URL, um, or return false if it doesn't find that. Um, so if it does find that, then we can just say, well, let's replace wherever we see that regular expression with the page number. So I'm using a, a, a replace there. Do you see that? Everybody remember how replace sort of works? Kind of. So you go find it, it says where in the string does that match? And then I put the other thing in here instead. So I'm using the template string, so this will be page is equal to three, page is equal to four, etc. So I'm taking that where I find it, replacing it. The next thing I need to do, I need to check if there's um, a question mark or not. Um, because the reason being, um, if we look at the URL, so let's say I start here. Let's say, let's say I go to search and there. Um, you'll see if I, the first, after the URL, I've got to put a question mark to start the query parameters. And then you see each query parameter is separated by an ampersand, right? Right? Yeah. So if I'm putting it in as the first parameter, um, it will be question mark page equals 10. But if it's the la if it's not the first parameter, then it will be ampersand, right? So, so this could be um, like here. I need to put the URL to page 10 would be question mark page 10, um, but if it was, for instance, category equals B, 
boots then I need to put it in as a ampersand so sometimes I need to add a, a question mark sometimes I need to add an ampersand and so basically what comes out is there's only ever one question mark so if there's no if there is a question mark there already I'm going to take the URL add in and page three etc um, if there isn't a question mark then I'm going to put it in as the question mark here so it's either and or question mark cool questions on that by chance is this going on YouTube uh, yeah yeah I'll throw it out okay so there's there's a lot of code in here and, and you can kind of read through and, and how I've done that um, as far as doing paging I, I wanted to give you a working example to kind of see this is how you might work through some of those different issues um, and the big thing big thing doing when you're building a page or you want to build it in such a way that you can easily reuse it right you want to build it in such a way that you don't have to change uh, much code to put it on all your pages got it yeah so so code reusability is a is a big deal when it comes to writing your pager okay um any questions kind of beyond that on on paging so Um, so all this code. Well, uh, yeah, it's not a question. I guess it's more of a comment. But yeah, yeah, that, that just it seems like a lot. And I'm just thinking, all right, I can go through it and I can watch the yeah. video and go step by step and understand yeah. it little by little. It's going to take a while to sink in. But producing mm -hmm. that, I don't, I don't know how I would ever get to that point. I mean, that's just uh, I mean, I, I, I can read it when someone else does it. But for me right. coming up with it which is what I would like to get to that point. I'm trying to see how I can get from where I'm at to, to that point. So, yeah. So the, the thing I, the thing to understand is, is generally speaking, um, pagers, pager code, you can often find off the shelf. Um, and the other thing is, is typically, um, once you write it, you don't have to rewrite it. So for instance, this one I could easily drop into um, the way I've written this one, I could easily drop it into any other website. Um, so what what I'm going to say is is that if you want to use this file that I've given you, use it. Um, you, um, there is a lot of hoops that you have to jump through to, yes, build this. I think this took me um, to build this out on my own. Um, I think took me close to three, four hours um, to, to put it all together. Um, and a lot of different research. Um, I don't expect you, honestly, to write this yourself. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, that, that's a relief. I, yeah. I'm not in favor of just getting some add-on and, and doing right. it, but at the same time, I also realize that, right. hey, I'm using Bootstrap. There's yeah. a lot of code that's going on behind the scenes, and yeah. I'm just this little tiny kernel in this huge... Uh, Sometimes my code is just yeah. in the middle of all that, and yeah, yeah, I, I can't write every every single thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You can't write everything, every single thing yourself. So sometimes you have to say, well, I'm going to use, you know, I'm going to use some code that somebody else wrote. And so this this code is is code. I'd like you to, you know, it'd be good to get to a point where you can understand it. Um, but it might not be, you know, a year or two, it might be two years down the road before you feel comfortable writing something like that. And that's okay. Um, because okay. most of the time you can just grab, most of the time there's, there's a lot of different, um, there's a lot of different options for pagers that you can get off the, off the uh, shelf and just slot it into your application and it'll work. Um, as long as you kind of understand how it works. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, so, absolutely. It's that's that's really good that you say that because I was just like, man, I'm I'm thinking with the, yeah. the labs and the test and and all that, and yeah. I'm like, shoot, I just want to be able to. Yeah, 
I should have prefaced yeah, yeah. this saying that I don't expect you to write this pager. I'm saying, here it is. <laughs> Here's the finished version of the pager. What I expect you to do is use it. I expect you to have pagers, um, but okay. I don't expect you to write one. Oh, yeah, good. Good. The, the right mindset is, is key because uh, I don't know if I speak for everybody in the class, but man, this is a, this is a wallop. I'm thinking, how, how the hell am I going to do this? Yeah. I'm saying, here's here's what I threw together. Use it. It works. Um, have I done a lot of testing with it? Obviously not. Um, but I I don't expect you to write the, the code for this pager. Um, so. Okay, thanks. And, and that's part of why I've also taken the time to try and document it with all these uh, JS docs to, so that you have a better understanding of, of how to use it. Cool? Yep. Yeah, that's good. So we'll just kind of use it like it's some sort of NPM package. Yep. That's, that's all I expect. 